So, uh, hello everyone. I think uh, people still will be joining uh, during the whole webinar, but I believe we can start. And uh, I would love to begin with some technical issues for today's webinar. So if you have joined um, this webinar as the participant, your camera will be switched off and your microphone is muted. Uh, but during the whole course of webinar, you're still, of course, very welcome and able to actively participate by asking questions. Uh, you can do so in our chat. We will have the technical moderator, Katrin, monitoring the chat and making sure that um, yeah, every question will be asked to our speakers today during the dedicated Q&A session. Um, and this webinar is streamed on YouTube and uh, recorded. Um, yeah, I don't believe that for um, a participant it would be a big uh, problem because the camera and microphones are off. But if uh, anything, please let us know. And when the technical part is getting done with, I would like to welcome you to our second of five live as an activist webinars. Um, with this series of webinars, we are focusing on realities and uh, challenges that democracy activists are facing uh, all over the world. Um, and we want to show you um, varieties of democracy, varieties of democratic activism, and also the variety of challenges over, all over the world that um, activists are uh, facing. And we do believe that um, even though, of course, uh, political and democratic situations are different uh, from country to country, from region to the region, we still can learn from each other. And we, of course, still can inspire more people around the globe become democracy activists in their countries. At uh, Democracy International, we sort of declared this uh, November the month of um, activism and uh, because of that every Wednesday of November we will host a webinar you can join us uh, during those webinars here on zoom or we are on the democracy.community uh, on the web page you can uh, follow the webinars online or uh, view them after the webinar um, already ended uh, and before starting, uh, I would like to thank Engagement Global and the Federal Ministry of Economic uh, Cooperation and Development of Germany. Uh, they are sponsoring these webinars and because of their support, these webinars are taking place. So last week we started off uh, with the topic of youth activism focusing on uh, Ukraine, Georgia, and the Black Sea region. We already talked a little bit about democratic backsliding, challenges that uh, war in Ukraine um, put towards the democratic developments in Ukraine and in the whole region. And today we will be focusing also on democrat democratic backsliding, but in a different part of the world, on possibilities to fight against it, um, and the protection of minorities in such a setting. And we will put our attention towards uh, Tunisia, uh, the Middle East and the uh, Northern Africa region. And we will talk about the um, Arab Spring and democratic backsliding after that, um, what it meant for uh, democratic developments in the region and what we can do to support democratic changes and become more active. And with this, I am very thrilled to introduce our speakers. We have two guests today. And um, with no specific order, I would like to introduce to you Kofran Wilkin, um, who has a background in international human rights uh, law and public policy. Um, she is a passionate advocate for a positive change in Tunisia. Uh, Kofran has made significant contributions to International uh, Center for uh, Transitional Justice 
and the uh, Council of Europe, and I'm significantly shortening the list. And uh, today she will speak about the current political situation in Tunisia and other countries of the region. And our second very welcome speaker is uh, Hisham Mahzi, uh, a human rights and political activist from Tunisia. And he will present uh, us uh, the political situation in Tunisia through the prism of activism work and will describe the challenges that activists uh, in Tunisia are facing. And uh, yeah, I would like to kick this off with Kofran. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, everyone, for this invitation. I'm very much pleased and honored to, to be uh, here with you uh, this evening to talk about um, a country dear to my heart, Tunisia, that I've been uh, working in uh, for the past uh, past years. Um, so yes, the, the subject today is democratic backsliding after the Arab Spring. And this is what we will be delving into. Um, first, what is democratic backsliding? It's this phenomenon that refers to the erosion of democratic institution and principle. And today I want to explore the cause of this backsliding, the impact it is having on Tunisian society and what can be done to reverse this trend. So Tunisia experienced the coup on July 25, 2021, when Kai Said, um, the current president, suspended the country's parliament and dismissed the prime minister. And this move sparked protest and a crackdown on opposition figure and critics to the president. The Anada party, which has been a major player in the Tunisian politics since uh, the revolution has been targeted in particular with several of its member um, being arrested. And um, the situation with political prisoners has become a major concern uh, for human rights group uh, with uh, Rashid Ranoushi, the leader of the Hinada party that was arrested last April and has been in prisons ever since. Um, he started a hunger strike to protest uh, his detention and the treatment of uh, older political prisoners. Um, Human Rights uh, Watch uh, reports uh, that there have been actually multiple cases of people be, being detained uh, without legal basis or without access to their family or their lawyers. Um, moreover, on the situation, the Tunisian uh, journalist unions has stated that the president has become the number one enemy of free press in the country. And journalists have been uh, facing increasing restriction and intimidation, intimidation. And there have been um, reports of arrest and harassment of um, journalists um, who are critical of the government. So Tunisia witnessed several significant changes um, in 2022, particularly in the area of human rights and electoral law. And one of the most contentious alteration was the decree law 2022-14, which criminalized the dissemination of officially false or correct news or information, but um, which is actually used by the regime to uh, silence journalists and political opponents. We cannot talk also about the situation in Tunisia without mentioning minorities. Uh, Kaisai discourse have, has created an, an environment in which um, hate and discrimination are being um, normalized and have put actually black Tunisian people and migrants at risk. Uh, in a speech in February uh, 2023, the president made uh, xenophobic remarks against sub-Saharan migrants, uh, saying that they were a threat to Tunisia social fabric and calling them, calling for urgent measures to stop them from coming. Um, and in the day following the speech, there were reports of uh, incidents and violence against Black people, including assault, uh, harassment, and vandalism. And um, we should all remember, actually, that uh, Tunisia was the first country in the MENA region to enact a law that penalized racial discrimination and allow victims of racism to seek uh, justice, but um, this normalization of hate speech at um, the highest level 
of the state since the coup is actually a disturbing reminder that there is um, still a lot of work to be done to eliminate racial discrimination in Tunisia. And this um, racist atmosphere had serious consequences on Tunisian economy, as several countries called for a boycott of Tunisian products. International investors became very um, hesitant to invest in Tunisia as the country's reputation for being tolerant and in inclusive was very much tarnished by this speech. Um, so yes, the relation between Tunisia and other African countries uh, were deeply strained as many African leaders um, express concern about the safety of African citizens in Tunisia. Overall, I would say that Tunisia's image of a bastion of democracy and human rights in the region was damaged as the country was seen as regressing in terms of racial equality. But what about um, democracy per se? And what is the actual situation in Tunisia today? Well, the Assembly of People Representative, uh, which was the Tunisian parliament, uh, elected directly by the people, um, in the past, it played a crucial role in the country democratic transition after the revolution. It was um, the primary, primary institution uh, through which citizens could express their political views and exercise um, their democratic participation. Um, the dissolution of that parliament uh, by the presidents was a major blow uh, to Tunisian democracy because without a functioning and transparent elected parliament, a state cannot be truly democratic, as it lacks the um, crucial element of representation and accountability. So in Tunisia today, there is simply no way for citizens to participate in shaping the rules that govern their lives. Um, the truth is that the President Said um, has been constantly advocating in favor of direct democracy during his campaign and since his uh, election. He was, he has actually positioned himself as the um, champion of a system where citizens participate directly into decision making without the need for representatives. He has um, portrayed himself as um, an adversary actually of um, representative democracy and their institution like the parliament. So that has been a constant uh, throughout his political career. Um, but while his access to power was fully democratic, he has locked any space for democratic uh, debate. Uh, for example, the 22 Tunisian plebiscite was not a true example of direct democracy um, because um, well, first, historically, plebiscites were never genuine uh, democratic tools, um, and they're often used by regimes um, as a way to legitimize the policy um, that are not actually representative of the will of the people. And in Tunisia, while it was organized by the government as a referendum, uh, the plebiscite was not um, accompanied by any meaningful debate or input from citizens and the proposed constitution was uh, drafted by the president alone, so um, which further actually demonstrate that uh, it was not an exercise of uh, democracy or democratic decision-making. So uh, it was more of a unilateral change imposed by the, by the presidency rather than um, truly inclusive uh, process for citizens. And that is why actually the Venice Commission won, warned Tunisia against it. Um, also the fact that the referendum was not subjected to um, parliamentary approval and the um, voters turnout was very low. It was less than 30% of Tunisian um, who actually voted for um, this new constitution. So this uh, situation, question the legitimacy of the referendum and the new constitution, which grants the president more power and suggests that many Tunisians actually do not support the, these changes. Actually, Inkifada, a citizen media in Tunisia has conducted a survey um, about how the bias of fear affects Tunisia's opinion. 
um, according to their survey, actually more than half of Tunisians oppose this uh, decision to suspend the parliament and 20% are actually hesitant to even criticize the president. So it's safe to say that Tunisians would actually prefer to see a more democratic and inclusive system um, in place. Um, so yes, that's that shows that um, you can use democratic tools to undermine democracy. And um, a government can abuse referendums uh, to create a false sense of democratic legitimacy in order to maintain power. And this manipulation of democracy um, undermine actually the credibility of the dom democratic process in its entirety um, because um, people will feel, and they already feel cynical about politics um, and they lose faith um, to the governments and without public trust, democracy cannot function. So yes, but what can we do about that? What <laughs> I would say that first, um, the release of political prisoners is a crucial step um, towards improving the democratic climate in Tunisia. Political prisoners are the symbol of repression and state control. Their release will uh, signal a commitment to accountability from the present regime. Uh, so it would be a very powerful um, gesture and it will help rebuild uh, trust between the government and citizens. So um, this is actually, I would say, the first step. And then I would say that without a strong civil society and free press to provide, provide checks on government power, um, Tunisia will remain an autocracy. And it's um, crucial to recreate a political culture where citizens are encouraged to participate and express their opinion without fear and hold their leaders uh, accountable. And finally, and it's a theme that is not often discussed when we talk about democracy in Tunisia, but I believe that it's really uh, intimately linked. Um, and I'm talking about transitional justice. Um, I believe that actually our collective failure to fully address the legacy of past human rights, abuse and corruption from the previous dictatorship created a sense of impunity among some of the political elite, which made it easier for them to um, engage in corrupt and autocratic practice. Um, so there is a lot to say actually about the way that transitional justice process was conducted and its incapacity to heal the deep states from its past uh, demons. Um, for example, the, the process focused on individual criminal prosecution rather than broad, broader systematic, systemic reforms, uh, which means that um, the underlying structure and attitude that allowed past abuse remained in place. And all this led to a, a flawed and incomplete healing process that didn't truly address the root cause of uh, dictatorship and the past abuses. So yes, um, I would say that um, it created a fertile ground for new tension and conflict to arise. In other words, you could say that Tunisia didn't fully learn from its past, which made it vulnerable to repeat the same mistakes that led to dictatorship again. So yes, but um, there is hope, I believe, um, despite the challenges that I've described, uh, there is hope for future democracy in Tunisia. First, because um, Tunisians have experienced the benefits of democracy, and they understand that um, despite uh, its um, imperfection, democracy offer a voice and a stake uh, for future to all its citizens. And um, there is certainly hope, but it will take continued mobilization and activism to achieve it. And uh, I believe that the memory actually of the revolution is still fresh in many people's mind and the hope for a better future um, has not faded. Um, Tunisians have experienced the benefit of democracy, such as the freedom of expression, the political participation, and more open and transparent institution. And now they have begun to understand that although sometimes slow and frustrating, democracy is always a preferable system to any repressive autocracy. Um, because, um, well, Tunisian, I believe, 
feel that they sacrifice democracy for um, a false sense of stability and power and order, sorry. Um, and the, the promise of uh, economic growth uh, used uh, as the as a justification for the presidential coup uh, has been an empty one. And now Tunisians feel really that they have sacrificed democracy for a mirage and and they are they are paying the price of it. Um, what can I say else about that? Um, except that the political situation under the leadership of Kai um, Said is in aberration and it reflects in no way the ideal of Tunisian people. Um, it cannot represent the aspiration of the people who have demonstrated their dedication to dignity and self-determination since the 2011's uh, revolution. And I think that uh, the road back to freedom won't be easy. <laughs> Uh, but uh, Tunisians have shown the world that they can fight for their democratic rights and uh, because people do possess a strong democratic uh, foundation in this country, I'm confident and hopeful for the restoration of democracy in Tunisia in the near future, yes. Thank you for uh, allowing me the space to share my uh, analysis about Tunisia and uh, Although um, I know that uh, the portrait that I gave was quite uh, grim, um, we should uh, allow ourselves uh, hope uh, for uh, a future uh, where democracy is possible in the MENA region. And um, I believe that uh, we will actually, as we did in the recent past, uh, restore democracy in Tunisia. So that would be my final words. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Thank you very much. And uh, before we continue with our second speaker, I would just like to remind our participants that you're very welcome to write your questions as they arise in our chat. And uh, in a little while, we will have a Q&A session where we will be able to directly ask your questions to our speakers. And now I would like to invite uh, Hisham, please. The floor is yours. So uh, hello, everyone. And thank you for, um, for this opportunity to share with you about the situation in Tunisia and in the region in general. Um, actually, I have given the participation in this webinar a very good thought due to the very difficult circumstances the world is living today. Uh, so I want by this opportunity to express my deep and unconditional support for the Palestinian people with uh, the atrocities they are living today and with this genocide that is happening in front of the whole world. And it seems like a uh, lot of countries are taking part in it and funding it directly. So uh, just like a very a small glimpse about uh, the link between the Tunisian people and the Palestinian people. Actually, in 1985, uh, Tunisia held some of the some of Palestinian leaders in Tunisia, and they were bombed in Hamam Shad in 1985. So this event created a very big link between the two uh, the two people of the two countries. Uh, and going back to what Rofran was saying, and thank you very much, Rofran, by the way, you have given a very good uh, overview of the situation in general. Uh, so, yeah, actually, uh, Qais Saeed in his speech, in his electoral speech, he had, he had used the Palestinian cause as, a, as an argument to be voted for. And today we see that the support was mainly false and there are no actual uh, decisions made about what's happening, what's happening in Palestine. Uh, so I have a, um, I have a presentation to share with you. Okay, uh, do you see the presentation? Okay, yes. just to be quick, because I think uh, Rofran uh, said all about it, just some key figures about the situation uh, here in Tunisia. Uh, so 2011, we had the Tunisian Revolution. So, of course, uh, 
the people overthrew the regime of Ben Ali. After that, in 2014, we had a new constitution that was considered as revolutionary in the uh, in the region, uh, like from the scope of freedoms and uh, like individual and collective freedoms. Uh, in 2019, we had a second presidential and parliamentary elections. So Qais Saeed was elected back then as a president, but in 2019, the the political regime is different from what it is today. Uh, in 2021, Qais Saeed assumes all power. And after that, like he made some referendum and uh, and another election to change the the constitution, which he wrote himself. He even like he recruited a, a group of specialists who wrote the constitution. And after that, after they made their proposal, like he he threw it away and he introduced his own constitution in his own words. And 2023 today, we are living a very big wave of arrests. Uh, starting from February against political opponents, journalists, and activists. So, yeah, this is uh, the general context. So, okay. All right. So, since February 2023, like a wave of arrests took place, targeting mainly political and civil society activists, resulting in 37 arrests, among them uh, 25 political opponents, three journalists and two judges. So among them, 15 cases for conspiracy against the national security without any solid foundation. So this is our very big problem today. Like Gofran said, we have uh, 25 political uh, prisoners in the prison. 15 of them are, um, are accused with uh, conspiracy, conspirating against national security and all of these cases like the lawyers have confirmed it they have no solid basis or foundations they are just allegations just people who are uh, practicing their political and collective freedoms and suddenly they are in jail for cons for conspiracy against national security okay so uh, many human rights transgressions were observed during the arrests so five of the detainees were transferred to hospitals due to severe health deterioration. It's either because of um, because of hunger strikes or because of torture in prison or because of uh, bad treatment in, in these prisons. Uh, so this wave resulted also in the ban from the political sphere of the conservative party and Nahda and of other several, uh, several political parties and collectives like Jabhat al-Khalas. Jabhat al-Khalas is a front um, consisting of a Nahda party and other several uh, political parties. It was created to uh, to be opponent to Qais Saeed after the, uh, the coup d'etat on 25th of July. Concerning the freedom of expression, we have a decree law that was issued in 2022 combating crimes related to information and communication systems. But in practice, this decree law constrains the press and freedom of expression in general. So under this law, we have today 11 journalists, seven political opponents, and 11 activists who are in prison because of this new decree law that was passed without, uh, without any vote in the parliament or nothing at all. So two journalists were persecuted before the military court after a media declaration against Qais Said, which is a very dangerous practice in a country uh, that had lived the revolution and that aspired for uh, for more values, more human rights values. So today we have civilians who stand before the criminal court just for expressing themselves in the media or on the social media or whatever. Uh, concerning the freedom of movement and the racist attacks that happened lately, so in 2023, Qais Said convened the National Security Council to address the issue of migration from Sub-Saharan Africa to Tunisia. During his address, he asserted that this migration was part of conspiracy aimed at altering the demographic composition of the country. So as we all know, altering the demographic composition of the country is a, is a fascist speech has to speak and is a very conservative speech, besides from being racist and xenophobic and etc. Uh, unfortunately, the speech, like we never heard of the speech before in Tunisia. 
altering the demographic composition. Tunisia was always uh, a country that uh, welcomes everybody and that is very diverse and people live and coexist together uh, independently from religion or color or, or beliefs or anything. So today we found ourselves in a, an economical and social crisis and moreover, we have a very big racist crisis. Okay, so uh, just to speak about the results of the anti-migration speech. So uh, the racist speech against migrants resulted in forcing migrants out of their residence, compelling them to seek refugee outside the country. We are talking about thousands of people. Unfortunately, there are no um, accurate statistics about it because uh, most of uh, the people, they were uh, like irregulars. They didn't have a residency or something in Tunisia. Uh, a migrant's residence was deliberately set ablaze that this happened in, uh, in Sfax this year. Acts of violence and discrimination resulted in the death of one migrant and injuries to four others during the night of May 20, 2023. Also tragically, a woman and her daughter lost their lives near the Tunisian-Libyan border while attempting to escape racist attacks. Uh, the photo of this woman and her daughter was really, really heartbreaking. They were dead uh, in the uh, in the desert, and it was it was a very, very big scandal. Concerning gender equality, uh, Kaisai declared several times openly his opposition to gender equality based on religious beliefs, uh, exactly inequality in inheritance. Uh, so regarding this point, uh, Kai Said mentioned this in his uh, electoral campaign. He said that I'm here to uh, guarantee that the religion will be applied in Tunisia. And of course, since there were not a very big debate about gender equality in Tunisia and public debates about it, uh, people just go through this populist speech and they just believe in it. Uh, without without any public debate at all and without an infrastructure really for debating these kind of things. 24 women were killed by their husbands since the beginning of 2023 against 15 killed in 2022. So we are talking about uh, feminicide here and we are talking about violence that is arising against women. Only 25 women were elected in the new parliament of 2022. Uh, before in the elections of 2014-2011, we had a law uh, which was the parity in elections. So, uh, like necessarily, you need to have a man, a woman, a man, a woman. But after that, Kai Said he eliminated this law, and the result today is 25 only 25 women in the parliament. Uh, concerning LGBT rights, in 2022, Tunisia refused the UPR recommendations about abolishing the annual examination, which is used by Tunisian authorities to prove same-sex conduct. So uh, I don't know if you know this or no, but uh, in Tunisia, homosexuality is condemned to three years of prison. And this is a colonialist law. It is a French law since 1912. Uh, when Tunisia was under the French uh, colonization. And until today, we have the same law. And it seems like uh, the political uh, class today is not willing to change it or not willing to adjust it or not willing to decriminalize uh, homosexuality. Violent homophobic campaigns taking place with the support of police and state members. Arbitrary arrests based on Article 230 are still in place. So I wanted to share with you this, uh, this key figures about uh, the backsliding of democracy uh, in Tunisia, which is a very, very dangerous um, indicator that uh, today we are going down a very hard road to go back to democracy. Uh, so I think um, I think today, like since the beginning of uh, since the seventh of October, uh, all the political maneuvers and everything is stopped. Everyone is facing their or uh, is taking the direction of what's happening in um, in Palestine, and. Uh, 
there is a very big frustration today in the Tunisia and in the region, and I think in the whole world. Uh, because like for forever, we've been talking about international institutions and international law and how to advocate for a just cause. But today, I think all of these are need to be questioned about again. And we need to rethink, uh, rethink democratic regimes and rethink democratic practices and rethink what is really a just cause and not a just cause. Uh, so yeah, I think that's it for me. Um, thank you very much. And I think um, before we proceed to the questions from the audience, um, I have a couple of questions and uh, if uh, we can, I would like to stay with you, Hisham, for a moment. Um, especially in such a restrictive setting and in such a turbulence in uh, the whole world, uh, what are the possibilities for activism? And maybe you can speak a little bit about the work you do as an activist and what challenges uh, uh, do you face? Okay, so after uh, after twenty fifth of July, uh, in fact, activism has has become very very difficult, and it's no longer like a trend at some point of Tunisia history after the, the, the revolution. At some point, like people, uh, everyone became activist and uh, people are really thrilled about it. Uh, today, uh, it's a very difficult situation considering that uh, we are in the beginning of a an autocratic regime. So until now, it has all the criteria, but it's not declared. But I think in the very near future, it will be declared. So uh, today, activists are facing uh, physical threats, uh, emotional and psychological threats, and uh, activism is no longer a comfort zone. So we are talking about uh, being militant and not being activist. Uh, we are talking about standing for the right causes and uh, defending what is just with uh, with open faces and with open names. Since even on Facebook or on any social media, uh, activists are persecuted, they are followed, they are harassed. And nothing of this seems to go public and nothing of this seems to uh, to be known to the world. So today, all like the people I know or the or the circles I have, uh, we are really, really in um, sometimes in a paranoid state. So sometimes we need to to be very careful about our physical security, not to go to some places. When we have meetings, they should be uh, they should have secret locations. Uh, we should uh, use some uh, platforms to to connect. Because like uh, Facebook or Messenger or WhatsApp or whatever, there are no longer safe spaces for activists since states have access to what activists are communicating. So it has become very, very difficult and very tricky uh, to be out there in the streets. Thank you very much. Uh, Gafran, do you want to add something? Well, I, I can... I cannot add anything that uh, Hisham hasn't already said. Um, the 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 way that he describes the situation is very much accurate. Um, being an activist today in Tunisia is nearly impossible. It's um, in the because there is no space for it. So the the discussion about how can we you know uh, uh, foster democracy or you know advocate for democracy in a space where um, expressing your opinion can lead you to prison or even death. Um, is not relevant, and what the what what Hisham describes uh, in uh, in terms of uh, what is to actually be an activist. Hisham, you you use the word militant, but I think that what you want to say is dissident. The activist has become political dissident in this country, um, and not militant because they are not violent, and Tunisian activists are not violent, and this is what what what's I think absolutely admirable in Tunisia is the fact that. Even against a violent state, against um, a brutal state, 
uh, Tunisian activists remain peaceful. Um, and, and that's something that I'm very proud of, for example, and uh, something that, that I really commend. And the situation that HM describes actually reminds me a lot of the situation of my parents, for example, when they were political dissidents during, under Bourguiba and then Ben Ali. So the situation is very much, um, we, it's a full circle. <laughs> we came back to that kind of dictatorship, the kind of dictatorship where you don't know what tomorrow is made of and you cannot project yourself because there is no space for self-projection in this kind of states. Um, so yes, what I also deplore is the silence of the international community about what is happening in Tunisia. I mean, we have been celebrated after the Arab Springs and we, we'd receive, you know, all the attention and all the... Uh, the international conferences were hosted in Tunisia and all the, I mean, we, we, we received collectively a Nobel Prize for Peace uh, to commend how we, we deal with democracy and how we deal with ourselves in the, the most peaceful manner. And today it's as if the, this past 10 years haven't existed. It's as if we did not at a certain moment of the history represented um, a hope for for the region, um, and and I see our I would say former allies uh, uh, actually ignoring the struggle and and the struggle. What what we are facing in Tunisia is will actually and is already having uh, dear consequences in the region, because we were the last beacon of democracy, the last beacon of freedom in a region that doesn't know freedom or democracy anymore. Um, and, and so the, your, your initiative, for example, uh, at Democracy International, uh, it's really much welcomed. The, the fact that you give a space and put a little bit of light on, on what is happening in Tunisia. So, but I would love to see actually more about that. Um, and, uh, and this is what the activists in Tunisia are trying to do is actually to, you know, ring the alarm and, and try to create a, a momentum about uh, around what's happening in Tunisia. So, yes, yes, I, I absolutely support what they do. And I'm absolutely aware of uh, the conditions uh, in which they, they actually exert their freedom of speech. And it's, it is dire. It is dire and it's very hard indeed. Uh, that was actually my next question. You uh, very briefly described uh, the situation in the rest of the region, but if you can maybe a bit more in depth uh, talk about uh, the state of democracy or not democracy in the region. Yes. Um, well, the situation in, in Tunisia um, draws actually parallels with, for example, what happened in uh, Algeria with uh, the... Iraq movement, which gained momentum in the early 2019. Um, and both the movement reflects, um, I would say, the aspiration for democracy. Um, the Iraq movement in Algeria actually, which witnessed widespread protest against uh, the political establishment that, that, that has been in power for decades. Um, and these people were challenging the statu quo and, and calling for democrat democratic uh, reforms. Um, and it has been absolutely crushed by the Algerian uh, regime. Um, but they both, I would say, uh, share a certain complexity and um, they show that we share the common challenges. Uh, that is, I would say that calling for democracy is a, a universal aspiration. And it's the same actually in Morocco, for example, with what happened in the reef um, and the movement uh, in, in the reef demanding for more freedom and more democracy and, and questioning the, the, the monarchy uh, in its essence. Um, um, the aspiration of Tunisian people are very much shared by, by our neighboring countries. And um, we face more or less uh, brutality from the state. But uh, yes, our destiny is very much linked 
with uh, what's happened in, in, in the other country, um, in the region, that's for sure. Thank you very much. Uh, Hisham, would you like to add anything? Yeah, in fact, uh, this is a very big question for me. And I think um, I mentioned it before. Um, I believe that no one is free until everyone is free. This is a very personal belief. So uh, we cannot talk about uh, a democracy in one place while all the neighbors and all the allies don't live a democracy. It will be a very, very big challenge. And countries today in modern politics, they cannot be separated from their environment, either geographically, historically, or economically, socially, etc. So it is very important when we talk about a country, we talk about other countries that have uh, similarities, uh, either in culture or in religion and economical structure, etc., etc. And I think today the region is living a very, very difficult time and a very frustrating time. And I think the events that are happening today and the genocide that is happening in Gaza will change forever the, the landscape and the region. Thank you very much. And I personally have a lot more questions to both of you, but I think it would be Great to first uh, go towards the questions from the chat. So, Katrin, if you can take a look at Yes. Thank you, Anya. So, the first question is a question from uh, Anna. She says, to get things done, no one should depend on anyone else to do it. So, if within communities and countries, activism was the normal thing to do, would that not con contribute uh, to establishing all these political politicians' behaviors and provide safety from uh, persecutions for everyone who works to make the society better. I ask because in successful communities and countries in Europe and the USA, everyone does some sort of volunteer and activist work. Uh, do you have anything to say? Well, the situation is absolutely not comparable. Um... <clears throat> I mean, of course, activism and volunteerism are important, but they are only possible in in a country where there is space for that, and in a country that is autocratic, where um, expressing anything, uh, your even the most, I would say, the, the most be, be benign opinion can uh, actually put you in a in a great risk for your life or your freedom. Um, the, 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 the <laughs> I'm not sure I understand actually the question because uh, I mean yes activism and volunteerism are important but they can only exist if the state actually provides the space for it otherwise it becomes political dissidence Uh, yes, maybe, maybe you have something to add or you can help me understand the question. Yes, uh, Anna, so if you have uh, another uh, comment uh, to this reaction, uh, please write it in the chat. Uh, then uh, Danielle has uh, also, oh, yeah, so she answered, um, that was the question. Uh, Danielle also has a question, what uh, role should the European Union play for Tunisia? Did we miss an opportunity after the Arab Spring? And what should the uh, EU do better now? How could we help as an NGO? So um, if you have any thoughts on that. <laughs> yeah, actually, I have, I have some thoughts on that. Actually, the EU is already playing a role in, in stabilizing Qais Saeed regime. And we saw this very cle clearly in the memorandum that happened between von der Leyen and, uh, and Qais Said, which was mainly about uh, the migration reforms and uh, the funds they were, they were about to give to Qais Said to protect the borders, either from uh, sub-Saharan Africans or, uh, or the coast borders. So for me, at least, or for some, uh, some part of the Tunisian, Tunisian people, it is very clear that uh, the EU is going in a direction and reforming all the migrants' laws 
We see this in France, it's happening today. Uh, also in Germany, we are talking about uh, new bills about migration. And of course, this is going very, uh, very harmoniously with uh, with what Kai side is doing. So what Kai side today is negotiating uh, migrants with uh, stabilizing his regime. And this is very clear today. Mm -hmm. This is a very personal uh, lecture and very personal analysis. If Rofran have another another thing to add or no, I think it's a very relevant analysis actually, and it's uh, I mean the, the the facts actually are showing that uh, uh, the European Union uh, has absolutely no problem of collaborating with uh, with an autocrat if it serves its interest. And the interest of uh, of the EU today is uh, border control. So, why not uh, delving uh, uh, billions uh, of uh, of uh, EU public funds and giving them to a dictator if it uh, helps them um, guard uh, the 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 borders of the of the European Union? So, yes, I act actually, you know, the the foreign policy of the of the of the EU is. Uh, it's quite tricky to understand because uh, they are calling for more democracy and freedom and transparency. And at the same time, they have no problem fueling um, dictatorships. So for us, Tunisians, it's very tricky to understand. And, and we, we, don't, we don't really understand, actually, these double standards. Um, so no, I don't think, Hijem, that your opinion is personal. I think that your opinion is very based, actually. <laughs> Sorry, but it's true. <laughs> Thank you. And before proceeding to the questions uh, from the audience, uh, we would like to take uh, a quick minute uh, for one other thing. So as I mentioned at the beginning, this webinar is uh, sponsored by Engagement Global and uh, Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. And because we receive this funding, we will require um, a lot uh, of reporting back. And one of the parts of reporting is uh, gathering some information from our audience. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, we will launch a poll, very simple and very short. Uh, right now, um, it will ask uh, simply the questions of like your age or if you are uh, part of a civil society organization, please take a few minutes of your time. We will dedicate a couple of seconds to the poll and then we will proceed to the questions. Yeah, so as I mentioned, a couple of seconds, and I think um, we can already go back to the questions from the audience. So the poll will remain open. Please, before leaving this meeting, make sure to um, fill the poll in. And um, yeah, Katrin, if we can go on with the questions. Thank you. Of course. So Daniel had also another question. What role does religious uh, fundamentalism play in Tunisia today? What is the current state of uh, secularism in Tunisia? I think we need to take a very honest look at the role of Islami Islamic fundamentalism. This is also a question to Hisham. Could we as activists here in Tunisia set an example in the interreligious but also a religious discourse? So, yeah, uh, about the religious uh, fundamentalism. Uh, in fact, after the 2011 revolution, there was a very big debate, a very um, identitary debate mm -hmm. uh, about secularism, about uh, religious fundamentalism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Unfortunately, this debate today uh, is, not, uh, is not relevant since there is a very big economical and social crisis and uh, after what happened with another party, so today the Tun Tunisian people think that uh, religious uh, fundamentalism doesn't go anywhere. 
and that they are in prison and everything is done, but we are still religious and we still cannot talk about secularism. So uh, we have a president who is religious, <clears throat> who preaches, who preaches uh, uh, religious uh, values in his speeches, etc. And it seems like there is a very big popularity of this populist speech. So I think uh, I think it is a very tricky, tricky uh, topic to be dealt with today. Mm. I can, can maybe add on, on that topic is, the thing is, Tunisia is historically a secular, secular country. Um, the, the way that the Tunisian modern state has been established uh, uh, by Bourguiba was of, of a, a country that is traditionally Muslim, and it has been present in the constitution since uh, the independence of Tunisia, but in fact, uh, has been actually uh, fighting any uh, expression of um, of religion uh, because it has, it was seen as a threat to um, to the regime, and this is the reason why, for example, uh, Islamic parties has been have been um, ostracized and uh, persecuted uh, in Tunisia uh, until the revolution. After the revolution, as Hisham said, there were a very important, I would say, debate about the uh, religious and moral identity of Tunisians, like how would Tunisians would define themselves and how important religion should play, um, how important the role of re religion uh, should have in, 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 the, um, in this new democracy. And um, I think that Tunisians have actually quite successfully find um, a balance, um, not denying their uh, historical uh, links uh, with uh, Islam as a, as a tradition, as a, a shared, I would say, um, corpus of value. But in the same time, uh, the way that actually, uh, the, for example, the, the, the debates were conducted in, in the parliament during the transition to democracy and during uh, the drafting of the constitution, religion didn't play a part in that. The people are religious themselves, but it is not religion that actually guides the way that poli policies are written or made or built in Tunisia. And this is the reason why, for example, it's a country that uh, has been quite progressive in terms of, for example, um, minority rights, um, um, gender equality, even if there is a, still a lot of, lot of, lot of uh, uh, work to do on that. But, but I don't believe that actually religion is the, is the main obstacle. I think that tradition is the main obstacle. And the way that um, Said presents uh, himself as a religious person is to actually give um, the reassurance that he is a moral person. And he did the same, for example, when he posed himself as the defender of the Palestinian cause in Tunisia by saying that I defend uh, the Palestinian cause and I defend the, 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 the Palestinian struggle for freedom. He posed himself as um, the champion of freedom and, and, and dignity. And all of that, I would say, is a play actually to reassure Tunisian and to unite Tunisian around him and give more legitimacy to his power. Um, but yes, religion fundamentalism is not what is at stake here, and secularism is not what at stake here. What is at stake here is uh, the future of democracy, is um, the economic situation of Tunisians. Uh, since the coup, actually, the, infl the inflation uh, has skyrocketed. Uh, the foreign foreign investment have collapsed completely because. Uh, it is not reassuring at all for foreign investors to look at a country where it is so easy to make coups. Um, so yes, the, the situation economically is absolutely catastrophic. And uh, I know that in Europe, and I say that because I'm a European too, uh, we love to look at uh, these countries through the prism of uh, religion and culture and etc. cetera. But, uh, this is absolutely not the priority for Tunisian today. It's absolutely not uh, if uh, their state is religious or, or 
or secular. The priority for them is, um, will they be able to feed uh, their children tonight? Uh, and this is what is important. Uh, what is important is uh, economical uh, um, growth. What is important is social justice. What is important is freedom of speech, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and not secularism or religion. This is a, a very tired debate that <laughs> that we don't engage in actually in Tunisia, and that, that is not relevant for the situation today. Okay, thank you for those uh, interesting answers. Uh, then we go to the next question. Uh, it's a question from Joe. Uh, can you talk in some detail about the everyday democratic reality in the different parts of Tunisia? Is there repression stronger in or around Tunis? How about the East Coast in the interior, in small places? Is there any room for democracy on the local level? Uh, so if uh, any of you have some thoughts on that. Well, um, I can talk about, for example, what happened in the past in terms of how the state organized the repression, because repression is always organized. Um, uh, you will find uh, more freedom, I would say, um, the farther you go from uh, the where the power resides. Um, but we are, uh, Tunisia is a is a very centralized state uh, where the police is absolutely present everywhere, where the state in itself uh, the, is present everywhere. We are not a federal state. We are a very centric à la française <laughs> state, unfortunately. Um, and so uh, it is very easy actually for the state to um, surveil the population in the whole territory because uh, it is present everywhere. Um, but uh, yes, maybe Hisham, you have something to add, maybe for me or an experience about that. Yeah, in fact, um, uh, in the capital, in Tunis, everything is there, like from the government uh, until uh, embassies, uh, the parliament, etc. So everything is centralized in Tunis. So this implies that more violence is happening in Tunis. Uh, on the other hand, uh, people in the in, in other cities uh, in Tunisia, uh, transgressions are happening, violations are happening. The problem is um, people are not well connected in, uh, in other cities. So sometimes we don't hear about uh, people going to prison for social media posts or something. Mm -hmm. However, in Tunis, uh, the, the spotlight is uh, concentrated here. So also the government is addressing their violence in a more clever way. So they are more repressing people in, in other cities and keeping, uh, how to say it, and keeping it, uh, keeping it out of the media. Uh, but in Tunis, like they are, there are more freedoms, more places to go to protest, etc. more engaged people, but also more violence. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, and I think the next question is also from Joe. In this very difficult time, what do you as activists find yourself reading or watching for inspiration or comfort? And if I can also add on that my personal question, because it's also sort of in this motive, uh, both of you in that way or another said that you uh, remain a democracy believer, activist, enthusiast, and uh, how do you believe in democracy in such times and how you encourage more people to step on this path? So if you can ask, answer both questions, both of you, please. So, so can you repeat that? Yeah, the, so the first one would be, in this very difficult time, what do you as activists find yourself reading or watching for inspirational comfort? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I have to go back again to the to the context, to the, to the international context. So uh, today, after uh, what's happening in, in Palestine, um, everything is, uh, everything in Tunisia is blocked. 
Okay, so no one is talking about what's happening in Tunisia. No one is talking about the economical crisis because mm -hmm. what's happening in Palestine is way more dangerous than what's happening in Tunisia. So everyone today is finding themselves um, in a sprint. It's either to organize protests or to organize uh, boycott campaigns or to organize anything related to the Palestinian cause. For example, uh, since uh, since bombing Gaza has started, uh, so for myself and, and some comrades, we started a, a film festival, which is 100% um, uh, volunteer and 100% uh, donation based. It's uh, so we are showing Palestinian resistant films in the streets uh, in some places that we consider as neo-colonial. Uh, such as cultural uh, centers, such as embassies, such as etc. So all everything is uh, concentrated there. So activists today they don't really have the luxury to find uh, inspiration or comfort. It's more frustration. It's more um, uh, that's yeah. It's more in the frustration and the feeling of not being able to do anything to to the thousands of people who are dying and to the people that uh, and to the children who are dying in front of the whole world so there's no i don't think that there's some comfort about that and another question was from my side um how do you still remain the enthusiast of democracy and how do you if you do encourage more people to step on this path of democratic activism. Do you, you want to answer that or, or maybe I can go? Yeah. Um, um, because because the, it's the best system. It's as simple as that. Because we experienced it as Tunisian. That's the first thing. We experienced democracy. It always has been um, an aspiration because I believe that actually democracy is a very much human aspiration it's not something that is you know linked to culture or anything it's something that is um, presents in the core of humanity um, freedom of speech freedom of conscience uh, freedom of opinion um, justice and dignity those are core values that are inherent to our humanity whether you come from Tunisia or from Sweden um, the path to those ideals are more or less difficult. Um, and we in Tunisia, we are facing the backlash and the backslide now, but it doesn't mean that we abandon or that we, that we don't believe uh, on, in those um, values anymore. On the contrary, um, what, what can we, what, what can I, what do I read or watch to remain hopeful? Um, well, personally, I'm reading Tolstoy, but uh, these days, <laughs> war and peace, because, <laughs> because, <laughs> because when, um, when the word goes awry, I believe that Russian literature can give us some, <laughs> some answers. Um, but, uh, what, what actually Hisham said about uh, what we feel as Tunisian is very much linked to what our brothers and sisters feel on the other part of the Mediterranean Sea in, in, in Palestine is very much true. I mean, we, we the MENA region, as we like to call it uh, now, um, is very much these days uh, turned uh, to 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 what is happening in the Gaza and Palestine, and they feel betrayed. They feel very much betrayed because they realize what they always felt, which is um, that the world is governed by a double standard, um, is happening today in Gaza, and they feel betrayed in the way that. Um, human rights and democracy and the value of life itself actually does not mean the same thing whether you come from Europe or the Middle East and whether you come from, for example, Ukraine or Palestine. And, and so there is, I think, a sense of um, cynicism 
um, people are really cynical about what is what is happening uh, today, and uh, and yes, we cannot talk about democracy without talking about what is happening in Gaza, and I think that uh, it's very relevant actually because it is interconnected, um, and as uh, Nelson Mandela said, uh, our freedom will not be complete until the Palestinian people are free. And I think that's very true. Thank you very much. Um, uh, as a Ukrainian, I would just a personal comment, probably not recommend trusting Russian literature for answers of uh, peace and war. Uh, <laughs> but uh... <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> well, you know, uh, as we say, you should uh, know what your enemies write in order to combat them. So. I would absolutely actually uh, recommend anyone to read Tolstoy. And I think that Tolstoy is a humanist. So, you know, in his, his, his books are universal. So, yes. Absolutely. I guess we can proceed to the next questions. Uh, yes, uh, I'm going to have a look. Um... Uh, then there is another uh, question from Anna. Do you work to uh, strategize your approach with people who are uh, too old, uh, who are the old activists who succeeded in implanting and maintain uh, democracy in places like Poland, uh, uh, or Estonia? It, Hisham maybe can can answer that. I know that um, prior to the Arab Spring, there were a lot of exchange uh, between um, co activists from uh, the former Soviet unions and Tunisian activists, uh, especially uh, web activists, and uh, and these is exchanges were very truthful because um fruitful because we had a, we can actually learn a lot from them and their struggle to um fight against uh, authoritarianism and dictatorship and to build strong democracy and maintain them um i i i don't know if it's still the case today but uh you know I believe yeah, in, the, actually, in the union of all democratic voices. So maybe, maybe Hisham, you have. You yeah, know actually, it's, that. yeah, it's still the same. Uh, we have a lot of exchange programs happening. It's either in Tunisia or outside Tunisia. Um, I've been also participating in one, uh, and so yeah, people from either from the global south or from the EU or from the US. Uh, it's very important to exchange expertise or to exchange um, what we are living as um, as activists in different countries. And the most important thing is that we work on what we have in common. Uh, and because like a lot of stories and a lot of and history is sometimes repeating itself um, in a different context or in different in different uh, geographical uh, place. So this is why this, it is very important to uh, to think of international solidarity between people who uh, who thrive to to build just and to work for social justice. Okay, thank you uh, for those answers. Then uh, there is also a question for Gofran. Um, you mentioned you're uh, European, but uh, Khalil is wondering how you can be European and North African, um, a North African activist uh, at the same time. Do you uh, have an answer on people that? People have uh, diverse identities. <laughs> it's as simple as that. As simple as that, you know. You, you can come from different countries and you can live in different countries and you can support uh, the progress of different countries. And I don't see that at all as uh, a problem. On the contrary. That's a clear answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. I don't think we are receiving any more questions um from the audience um so i would propose to 
conclude this webinar with um, the message of um, any hope in democracy or what we can do to promote democracy. What can we do to live in a more just and democratic society? If you have a short glimpse of hope for us. Um, give platforms. And what you are doing, for example, here, I think it's uh, it's really helpful and it's really important. And this is the kind of in initiative, even if it's, it may appear small or insignificant, it is not. It is important to create those spaces and to multiply those spaces until you can until you bring back democracy into the public debate. This is how actually you create a narrative. This is how you create f movements and how you convince people that democracy is important is by allowing democracy to be a subject of public debate like we are doing tonight. Um, so yes, I would say that create space, invite uh, young people younger than us even because they, they have a lot uh, to say about what is happening whether it's in Tunisia or any country actually, um, give voice to the youth um, because uh, youth actually moves uh, countries. It's the youth that uh, that actually is able to do revolution because they have the, the energy, the power and the hope to do it. And so I would say, yes, give a voice to youth and you will see. <laughs> You will only have democracy flourishing everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I will. Uh, I will add something to what my friend said about uh, this optimistic uh, message to to communicate. Uh, for me, it is very important to create uh, alternative platforms such as this one to also uh, deconstruct. Uh, the neo-colonial uh, rhetoric that we are living today and we are facing in everyday life. Uh, so, yeah, for example, uh, sometimes I start to believe that some countries in the world, they don't believe in democracy in other regions. Uh, because like with democracy and with direct democracy, everything flourishes. Uh, there's prosperity, there's understanding, there's uh, political maturity, etc. And I am certain that uh, when some imperialistic states uh, will notice that this is happening somewhere in the world, I'm sure that they will bring the other democracy, the democracy with the gun. That's why we should really, really be vigilant about the uh, about the hegemony and about the dominant rhetoric. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much to everyone who joined us today. Uh, we uh, sincerely invite you and hope to see you in our um, future webinars every Wednesday of this month at the same time you joined us here today. And thank you very much to our both incredible speakers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Hisham. Uh, yep. It was such a pleasure, actually, to, to meet a fellow Tunisian. And thank you um, to Democracy International for allow, allowing this, this uh, discussion to happen. It's very important. And um, I'm really thankful for that. I'm really grateful. So thank you very much. It was a honor, really. Thank you very much. It was a very big honor to be participating as a speaker uh, in this webinar, and I hope a more uh, good opportunity